Our reading today was pulled from the ACLU site. The author is, has remained unnamed because she is underage. North Bend has been my home for my entire life. I was born in this town, and I was raised here by two loving parents who always did their best to teach me right from wrong. And so far, and so for the past couple years, I have been trying so hard to end school-sanctioned discrimination of the LGBT students at North Bend High School. I faced harassment and discrimination so many times at school for both students and staff members. And my partner at the time, Liv, was physically attacked at and around school by people who also yelled anti-gay slurs at her. The other open LGBT students I knew also had terrible experiences, including one of my best friends who the principal forced to read the Bible at school as a punishment. My parents raised me to always be honest. They told me that if you tell the truth, people will trust you, people will believe you, and people will follow you. They raised me to know that if you're honest to a person, or if you're an honest person, you're a strong person. And they always told me that if you're strong enough to stand up and someone else isn't, you should stand up for them. And that's why I filed my complaints with the Oregon Department of Education. Simply put, all students deserve to feel safe at school. We all just want to learn and be ourselves. We deserve better from the North Bend School District. Now let me tell you about just a small portion of what happened during my time at North Bend High School. The first day of my junior year, I walked into school holding Liv's hand. Liv was my girlfriend at the time and is still my partner in this fight to end discrimination. It was intimidating and scary being the only openly gay couple in the entire school. I didn't know how anybody was going to react or what they were going to say or do. There were the odd stares and whispered slurs behind our backs, but I grew more confident when I learned not to care about what people think. But then things started happening where I felt my physical safety was in jeopardy, and the principal's response, nothing, was disheartening. I'll always remember when Liv and I were headed off to campus for lunch one day. We were walking the school's back parking lot when all of a sudden the principal's son sped towards us in his car. We thought he was going to hit us. Instead, he drove right up next to us, yelled out the most degrading term, and veered away. It was terrifying. At that moment, it just kind of switched something in me. I realized that discrimination and people's opinions here are really so strong that some of us could get hurt. I could get hurt just for being myself. I eventually reported this, but was not surprised when nothing happened. He's popular, a football player, and his father is the same administrator who repeatedly failed to take my complaints seriously, the same administrator who forced my best friend to read the Bible. I even reported online harassment to the principal after another student made fun of how I looked and told me to kill myself. Instead of protecting me, the principal made me sign the bullying policy. It was as if I was in trouble for reporting bullying and feeling unsafe. It seemed like they didn't care about my safety at all. I reported discriminatory incidents to the principal so many times, way more than I can mention here. Nothing ever changed. The discrimination wasn't an isolated incident, and it didn't just come from students. When I told the principal that my civics teacher called me out in front of the entire class and said same-sex marriage was pretty much the same thing as marrying a dog, the principal told me everybody has a right to their own opinion. The next day, the teacher apologized, but as I walked away, he said, don't go marrying a dog. After so many complaints to the administration, and so little change, we needed another tactic. We decided to tell the Oregon Department of Education what was going on. And that's led us to here, trying to hold the school district accountable, no matter how hard they try to deny it is a, west, a widespread problem. Liv and I may be the public faces in this case, but it's about way more than us. While I have graduated now and won't experience any change firsthand, I'm still fighting because I know 
there are other LGBT students who don't feel safe at school, and there will be more to come. School administrators can no longer be indifferent to physical and verbal harassment of LGBT students and staff. Authority figures shouldn't use religion to mistreat vulnerable students, and the administrators, staff, and teachers and students in North Bend all need real training on LGBT rights. I want young LGBT students everywhere to know that they're not alone, that there's something you can do to better your situation. If you can do something even minuscule, something tiny, to better your situation or someone else's situation, you should do that. You have the ability to make change, and it's really rewarding. There are people out there who will support you, and when you're ready, you should speak up to So we're changing things up a little bit and saving the musical reflection for after this morning. At this very moment, tens of thousands of people are lining the streets in Salt Lake City to watch the Utah Pride Parade. Clearly, many of us in the congregation are down there as well. Tens of thousands isn't such a bad number for a state known for its extreme conservatism. You know? Tens of thousands. The celebration is massive. There are costumes with color combinations I didn't even know existed. There are music vendors, and best of all, there are so many people unabashedly being themselves. They are showing up in the glory of who they are, affirming their own existence, as well as the existence of others. Utah Pride Festival, which includes today's parade, is a love fest of epic proportions. In fact, Pride is such a joyous event that it is actually easy to forget why it started in the first place and why we still need to talk about it. In our American history, the LGBTQ community has been consistently marginalized and terrorized. The 1960s weren't much different in that respect than the decade before, and the 50s weren't terribly different than the decade before that, either. Our track record for human rights has been less than stellar, in all honesty. Still, there were safe havens to be found and the most common community refuge in the 60s were gay bars. Here, gay men and women could find respite from the cruelty they faced in their daily lives, and it was here that untold numbers of men and women found affirmation and briefly, always briefly, peace. A 2017 article from History.com explains the relationship between the LGBTQ community and the bars as well. Quote, Solicitation of homosexual relations was illegal in New York City, and there was a criminal statute that allowed police to arrest people wearing less than three gender-appropriate articles of clothing. For such reasons, LGBTQ individuals flocked to gay bars and clubs, places of refuge where they could express themselves openly and socialize without worry. However, the New York State Liquor Authority penalized and shut down establishments that served alcohol to known or suspected LGBT individuals, arguing that the mere gathering of homosexuals was disorderly." End quote. Thanks to activists' efforts, these regulations were overturned in 1966, and LGBT patrons could now serve alcohol. Also from History.com, Engaging in gay behavior in public, holding hands, kissing, or dancing with someone of the same sex, was still illegal. So police harassment at gay bars continued, and many bars still operated without liquor license, in part because they were owned by the mafia." End quote. Stonewall Club, since renamed Stonewall Inn in Manhattan, was one such establishment. And before we romanticize these safe havens, Let's be clear that gay bars then were not the same as we know them now. Today, gay clubs and bars are positively associated with vibrancy, self-expression, and acceptance. And then, quote, Stonewall Club was, a registered, was registered as a type of bottle bar 
which did not require a liquor license because patrons were supposed to bring their own liquor. Club attendees had to sign their names in a book upon entry to maintain the club's false exclu ex exclusivity. The Genovese family bribed New York's sixth police precinct to ignore the activities occurring within the club. Without police interference, the crime family could cut costs however they saw fit. The club lacked a fire exit. It lacked running water behind the bar to wash the glasses. It lacked clean toilets that did not routinely overflow and palatable drinks that weren't watered down beyond recognition. What's more, the Mafia reportedly blackmailed the club's wealthier patrons who wanted to keep their sexuality a secret. End quote. It is important to pause and reconcile those two truths. Gay bars were safe havens, and gay bars were inherently dangerous to the physical well-being of its patrons. On the morning of June 28, 1969, police raided Stonewall Club once again. This was not a new occurrence. It was one in a long string of discriminatory targeting. This one, however, was a surprise. No one had tipped off the bar that morning, and no one knew the police were coming. Raids are not peaceful events. Patrons were harmed and humiliated. In addition to the acts of aggressive violence, the gender appropriate statute, the gender appropriate clothing statute, gave police the power to check a suspected crossdresser's genitals, and the power was employed that morning in force. In all, 13 people were arrested. And something shifted at the bar that morning. And the present and those present didn't simply disperse the way they normally did. They clung together outside the bar and stayed in community with one another. They were angry, they were hurt, and they were tired. They were tired down to the bones of their soul. And things escalated. The description of the next five days is a phenomenon in and of itself. Law enforcement confirmed it as a riot. The media printed it as such. And these days, we talk of the origins of crime as the Stonewall Riots. In fact, quite a few media outlets consider the Stonewall Riots to be among the top 10 worst riots in American history. However, Stonewallers those who were actually present for the incidents maintained that it was not a riot. It was an uprising. The days between June 28th and July 3rd were a rebellion against discrimination and harassment. The following year, in 1970, the community marked the anniversary of the uprising with the first Gay Pride Liberation March. It was not a parade. It was a protest against the unjust treatment of the LGBTQ community. It was a statement for the dignity of all people. The initial resolution for the march was presented at the Eastern Regional Conference of Home Fire Organization, reading in full, quote, that the annual reminder, in order to be more relevant, reach a greater number of people and encompass the ideas and ideals of the larger struggle in which we are engaged, that of our fundamental human rights be moved in both time and location. We propose that a, dis a demonstration be held annually on the last Saturday in June in New York City to commemorate the 1969 spontaneous demonstration on Christopher Street, and this demonstration be called Christopher Street Liberation Day. No dress or age regulation shall be made for this demonstration. We also propose that the home file organizations throughout the county, throughout the country, contact and suggest that they hold parallel demonstrations on that day. We propose a nationwide show of support. And fast forward 48 years, and here we are. June 28th quickly approaches. The annual reminder and the nationwide support are dreams realized. The protests have turned into celebrations, and the fear and the anguish the Stonewallers lived has diminished with time. 
and successful human rights campaigns are about me. Krista Lee Steele Newsman, 42. Vicky Gutierrez, 33. Tanya Harvey, 35. Celine Walker, 36. Felicia Mitchell, 45. Zachariah Fry, 28. Amaya Tyre Berryman, 28. Sasha Wall, 29. Carla Patricia Flores Pavon, 18. Nino Forston, 36. Gigi Pierce, 28. Nicole Hall, 36. These are the known 12 transgender people murdered so far in 2018 as a direct result of their transgender identification. 40% of all transgender adults reported attempting suicide. 92% of them said it was before the age of 25. 44% of lesbians and 61% of bisexual women experience rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. 26% of gay men and 37% of bisexual men experience the same. 48% of bisexual women who are rape survivors experience their first rape between the ages of 11 and 17. But there's more. 85% of victims' advocates of victims' advocates reported having worked with an LGBTQ survivor who was denied services because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. 85%. And there's always more. The rate of reported harassment towards gender nonconforming youth in K through 12 schools is 78%. The rate of reported physical assault of gender non-conforming youth in K-12 schools is 35%. And the rate of reported sexual violence perpetrated on non-gender conforming youth in K-12 schools is 12%. And please keep in mind, those are only the ones reported. 40% of homeless youth in this country identify as LGBTQ. And LGBTQ youth are five times more likely to have attempted suicide than their cis hetero peers. Statistics are hard to hear. They make us cringe, maybe shift a little in our seats, maybe look away. We must know these numbers, though, just as we must know the origins of our beloved pride parade. We must bear witness to these atrocities so that we never stop working for justice and we never begin to believe that pride is nothing more than a big celebration filled with frivolity and lightness. It is a celebration. It is. And it is a celebration of humanity with a foundation weighted in the survival of violence. It is a demand to be seen and a request for solidarity. For solidarity. The survival of a marginalized people is too often not decided by only marginalized people. Allies are needed. Allies, warriors, kin, and community. Pride festivals are a way of saying, be with me, stand by me, so that my right to exist is never outlawed again, and so that I may live with dignity and peace. Happy Pride Month.